Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. All right, we had some ISM uh, manufacturing data came out uh, just this morning, a little bit weaker than expected. Let's bring in Tim Fiore. He's the chair for the Institute for Supply Management. The kids know that as ISM. <laughs> um, Tim, talk to us about the, the, the data we saw today. I'm just looking at the headlines. Came in a little bit below forecast, a little bit below last period as well. Yeah, hi, Jess. Hi, Paul. So the best way to describe this report, although our number is contracting again, is uh, stable, stagnant, stuck, sluggish and flat yep. so you know the preponderance of the comments comments indicated over the last couple of months we're kind of on a plateau uh, as you know your listeners we started to, to see a grow out back in january it was a weak grow out not a very strong grow out but in the month of april and then, then again the month of may we're basically stuck and it, it feels the reason why we're stuck is that there is very little demand and the reason that there's very little demand is because people are waiting for rate cuts so at, at, when we started the year, the rate cuts were actually a tailwind. Now with the lack of tail of rate cuts, we're actually looking at a headwind. So the, the, the manufacturing sector is pretty much frozen and they're unwilling to really invest in CapEx and in working capital and to some extent in people until the horizon clears up. So Tim, what does this mean more broadly for the economy? Well, you know, I think we're, Jess, we're six to nine months out ahead of the general economy. So, uh, you know, we started to grow out in January, as I said, which would indicate that maybe the general economy would start to see a, a better uplift in the fall. But with this plateauing, this could be just a manufacturing plateau, depending on what the Fed does on the rate side. But I, I don't I don't think I'm, we're going to see much movement here. I mean, as time goes on and there's a lack of demand, there's going to be a lack of work. One of the really positive things here of the report is that we're stable on a revenue basis month to month, which is good, but we've been expanding slightly for the last three or four months, and now we're stable, uh, which really means that as, as your pipeline, your backlog you know, declines, you have less to work on, we could see that production number go into contraction, which would be a whole different story. Right. So, so that's the first story here. I already mentioned the demand. It's the weakest new order number we've had in a year. Last May was worse at 42, which is a lot worse than 45, by the way. But so, OK, we're not as bad as last May. And then, you know, the positive thing here is on the uh, the prices number, where although we're still expanding, we're not expanding as much as we were in April. And we just finished our forecast and our, our respondents have indicated that for the whole year 2024, we're looking at a 1.9 percent price growth on the, the cost of things that they buy, of which we've already seen 1.6 percent so far this year. So if, if you take that, it really says that we're looking at you know, essentially, you know, not much more of a price increase as we close on the year. And, you know, hopefully that will stir, spur some demand here. But, you know, I think, you know, everybody's waiting for, for yep. a little bit more solidity and some positive news here so that people will move on. In the meantime, we've gone from a, a profit-focused performance year to a profit-focused performance year with a bigger priority on making sure right. you're liquid in the event something wrong happens. And that's yep. kind of where we're at. All right, Tim, thanks so much for joining us. Always appreciate getting your thoughts here on ISM Day. Tim Fury, chair for the Institute for Supply Management, talking about these uh, ISM manufacturing numbers came in uh, lighter than expected. And again, the one that jumped out at me, uh, Jess, was this new orders uh, came in at 45.4. Consensus was 49.4, so a big miss there. Last period was 49.1. So the new orders kind of gives you a little bit of a leaning indicator, weaker than expected. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's talk technology. Let's do that? it. Switch why it not? up. I mean, also why not? with we... apparently what the New York Post calls the best dressed man on Well, that's, that's debatable, dude. I mean, I, I actually have a problem with his wardrobe, but I just I tend to look past it. Dan Ives joins us because he's a big Penn State fan, so I look past it. Dan Ives, Managing Director and Senior Equity Analyst for Wedbush Securities. Um, hey, Dan, thanks so much for joining us here. Um, let's talk about chips. And we talk about AI, and you've been on front of this AI trade and really getting people up to speed on on AI and how to play it. But 
Are we still focusing on the chips here? Is it NVIDIA and everybody else? I mean, look, it, it's their ultimate. It's Jensen and NVIDIA's world. Everyone else paying rent. And and if you look as this plays out, now look, AMD, Lisa Su, potentially Intel, others in the semi food chain, they will start to see a benefit 2025, 2026. But for now, there's only one game in town, and that's NVIDIA. And right, I, I just continue to see an autobahn type of path for Jensen and NVIDIA. Yeah, if anyone watching our YouTube feed can see Dan now, it's kind of in a cotton candy sort of colored <laughs> shirt right now. But you know, speaking, whereas I am right. in a charcoal gray <laughs> suit, very, very exactly. Wall That's the way I was brought up on Wall Street. Dan's you can't, you can't get the investment banker out of him. No, yeah. <laughs> Dan brings much more color to the whole game. No, Dan, Dan always does. So, Dan, but obviously speaking sweeny, of chip stocks, if you look at the look. socks this morning, the Philadelphia <laughs> Semiconductor <laughs> Index, uh, that moving higher, obviously it houses bellwethers like Nvidia. AMD and Intel, but talk to us more about uh, TSMC and some of these other NVIDIA suppliers in Asia and what that really means for the development uh, coming off of the back of obviously we're going to have that 10 for one stock split for NVIDIA coming to fruition uh, right before the opening of trading on June 10th. So not too far away here. Yeah, Jess, I mean, our team was in Taiwan last week. Party's just getting started. And for TSMC, for the for the other semi players, I mean, we're seeing demand well into 2025 and this is not double ordering i think it just shows this ai revolution's kicked off and it's not just the big tech players that are going to benefit now it's the second third fourth derivatives and that's what we're seeing play out in tech a have and a have nots that's clearly playing out across nasdaq hey dan you know just look at looking ahead a little bit here a week from today i believe we're gonna have that developer conference for apple it just seems to me that there's a the expectations there, I think investors want to be kind of wowed a little bit by Apple and maybe some AI discussion. Are we going to get that or are we going to be disappointed, do you think? Yeah, look, we'll be there a week from now. And I, I think it's the biggest event for Cook and Cupertino in over a decade because this is AI coming up. I think most consumers, their interaction with generative AI is going to be through an Apple device. So this is important for developers to lay out the stack, what the feature functionality looks like. I think it's the early start of an AI app store. And then the drum roll to an AI-driven iPhone. In terms of iPhone 16, will ultimately be iPhone 17. I think it's a renaissance of growth. It's a massive event for Apple. What about switching it up and looking over to Tesla? Because I know that's a name that I believe you took off of one of your conviction lists earlier this year. Where do you see that stock headed from here? Yeah, it's been a Category 5 storm, but I think they're starting to get through it. I think if you look at demand in China, it's stabilized. And ultimately, check by check, I think they're getting rid of some of the overhangs. Now, one is late next week. Does Musk get that 2018 comp package approved? I think it does get approved. I think that's been a bit of an overhang. And then it's really about demand stabilizing. And the next part of the story, the sub-30K vehicle, as well as FSD, taking hold. I think that's a big part of the valuation to the Tesla story. So Ford Ford Tesla and a, you know, a, a lower price car, whether it's sub 30,000, whatever the price tag is. I mean, in your modeling, Dan, can they make money on, on a per unit basis at that price point? They can't. I think they can make money up to about 23 to 24 K. But that's, look, that the scale and scope, that's been that's been the whole key of success. I mean, despite everything that we've seen, it used to be 55000 Now they can make money at twenty two, twenty four thousand. 24000 So I think that's really something that you're seeing across, I think, the industry. Their ability to scale, that's a huge part of their advantage. And of course, not just here, but especially in China and around the world. Are there particular technical levels you're watching for Tesla's stock? to see like if the worst of the pain is already passed. Yeah, I think, look, I in my mind, from a sentiment perspective, it has just been as negative as I've seen it in a number of years. I think as we get past wait next week, the shareholder meeting, you start to see stabilization in 2Q and 3Q, and then I think investors start to look into next year. But again, betting against Musk, betting against Tesla, that's been the wrong bet, Despite, you know, I think many that have piled on, 
And I think yet again, this will be proven to be more of a golden opportunity to own Tesla rather than the start of a negative decline. All right, Dan, thanks so much for joining us. As always, appreciate it. Dan Ives, he's a managing director, senior equity analyst at Wedbush Securities, uh, joining us here talking all things technology. That's one of the great things about chatting with Dan. You can kind of go all over the tech map. That's true. And get a, a conviction <laughs> comments is kind of the way That's I, right. I phrase it. The Wall Street's best dressed, <laughs> yeah. according to the New York Post. But, Paul, uh, we, we call you the fashion police here, though, yeah, at oh, Bloomberg. Yeah, uh, totally. Especially summer so Fridays. So if you, the- you <laughs> saw Dan in the Bloomberg oh. headquarters, would Big you problem. stop him? Big Remember last problem. summer, I think somebody came in with sandals. It was yeah, socks yeah, and sandals. Yeah, flip-flops does not work in the office. Paul can, can was not here for that? it. <laughs> can we all agree upon no sandals or flip-flops? <laughs> I'm not going to agree on that. I mean, come on. I'd like to come barefoot. Yeah, well, Dan, you're right. He was written up in the New York Post uh, right. for his uh, uh, wonderful wardrobe that he wears. Colorful. All around, and it, plus, it's all around the world because the guy's always on, right, on the road Right, you got to learn here. about where he buys all of these outfits. Exactly. <laughs> you're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business App. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. SPX up about 10, 11% this year. SPW, the equal weighted index, up about uh, 4.5% here. So still some of those big names kind of driving it here a little bit. Also, the S&P 500 up 23 of the past 31 weeks. So the, since the October low, if you want to go back, that was around October 27th yep. when the S&P made that low, up about uh, coming into today's trading, 28% since that. Not bad. Let's see Not what bad. the pros are doing here. Margie <laughs> Patel is certainly a pro. She's been doing this uh, for some time, has some great perspective. Margie Patel is a senior portfolio manager at All Spring Global Investments, joining us from uh, Boston uh, via Zoom. Margie, uh, when you talk to your clients here, what do you tell them about these markets? Should they be focusing on the big tech names? Should they be broadening it out to some other sectors? What kind of discussions are you having with your clients these days? <clears throat> Well, we still think the tech sector is one of the leading sectors because they still have secular growth and cyclical growth behind. And so we don't think the sector is really overvalued uh, considering the growth that they should have over the next one, two, three years. We think they still are pretty fairly priced and it's still going to be one of the fastest growing sectors. So it's still a market that's selective. We see opportunities in some of the industrials, particularly those companies that are linked to some of the, the mega trends, such as uh, the uh, move to the cloud and data centers and reindustrialization, reshoring, things like that. But a more selective market I think is going to continue. Well, Margie, as the calendar just flipped to June, obviously there's different ways to cut kind of seasonality, different factors. I know people like to talk about the June swoon or even sell it may and go away. But obviously, if you look over the last decade, it really hasn't worked as well. If you use the SEAG go function in the terminal, you can see how the S&P 500 has only been down twice in June over the last decade. So in 2022, during that bear market, and then in 2015, obviously that correlated with what was going on with some manufacturing slowdowns in China, and then obviously those high indebted European countries uh, that was worries of default there uh, but in election year periods typically the summer can actually be a stronger period but that usually comes when there's more clarity as far as who the winner would be very different kind of setup that we have this time around but I'm wondering over the next few months where do you see stocks headed from your as far as when Paul and I were just talking about the rally that the S&P has been on since that October low? Yeah. well I don't think you can really look at the history books uh, to give you comfort for how this year is going to work out. I think we have just a narrow window for the Fed to act if they're going to lower rates before they'll want to be quiet before the election. But typically, election years are strong years. Uh, they may waffle around mid-year, uh, like right now. But no matter who wins, they, they seem to have a strong finish to the end of the year. So we think that we may see a little bit of back and forth here, uncertainty over Fed policy, over world economy continue um, to show any weakening trends. And uh, then the market, I think, will look uh, to the end of the year and be pretty optimistic again. So we're looking for a strong finish. Margie, how much is that strong finish predicated upon earnings? Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on kind of what we're seeing in the earnings from corporate America this year and what you expect for the remainder of the year. Can that be a, a driver of stocks? Well, I think it'll be more of the same. Uh, companies, just as last year, they're more or less continuing to surprise with better earnings. Profit margins are being maintained. I think that's a little benefit from this uh, little above average inflation that's helping companies. And really, if you look at the first quarter, we had growth in the GDP of 1.3. 
S&P revenues are up, I think, 4%, profits are up 10%. So I think it shows you that the standard and poor's or NASDAQ companies are not necessarily reflective of what you see for the, say, the GDP numbers. And it shows companies can still grind out uh, profits that are way above the GDP growth. So we think that's what we're going to see is, you know, more something close to that 10% earnings growth for the year, for the rest of the year. What are some of your top questions that you're getting from clients right now? Well, I think everyone is concerned about interest rates. Uh, will the Fed act or won't they act? And what influence will that have on the economy? Uh, I personally don't think it's going to have very much of a material impact either way, a quarter of a point. Uh, I think won't really change the direction of the economy. It's pretty strong. And people are, of course, very concerned about the deficit, uh, how where the, uh, the money will come from. Uh, will, will we need it from foreign investors? Will that cause treasury rates to go up as the government needs to finance a very large, um, very large deficit? So I think those are the things that people are focusing on, really more macro rather than any individual sector. Margie, for no particular reason, this studio of radio professionals feels like they are experts on the industrial, the electrical <laughs> grid here. Um, and a lot of folks feel like, you know, maybe utilities are a way to play AI and things like that. How do you think about uh, the grid, the power grid, and how it plays into this economy? Well, I think it's it's funny. It's uh, one of the most boring parts of the market has become one of the most hot and trendy parts. Uh, I think the, the, the utility companies, um, I think, are a rather limited way to play the growth in power consumption that we expect we'll see from economic growth and, of course, from the data centers. Uh, and I think a uh, more interesting way to take advantage of those trends really is which companies will participate in the growth, uh, building the infrastructure, hardening the grid, things like that. Uh, again, so that says more companies in the industrial space rather than the utility space. Although you could make a case for some of the um, independent power companies that have excess power that will be able to help balance the, uh, the, the needs between various regions and between, uh, say, unreliable or variable green sources versus space loads such as uh, coal or, or gas and nuclear. When you're looking at utilities companies, typically people think of them as obviously the consistent dividends that they pay and low volatility, but also in addition to the AI sort of play with this, could this be basically investors seeing that peak in rates that's happening when you're seeing a particular corner like this that has been rallying since it's uh, April 19th lows that we saw for that particular sub-industry group? Well, really, when you look at the utilities, when you look at their price earnings ratio and you look at their dividend yields, on that basis, they aren't really attractive, as, as attractive, say, as, as they've been historically compared to treasury rates. Uh, when you have a 10-year treasury, say, four and a half, four and three quarters, something like that, uh, most uh, dividends on, on utilities are a lot lower. So they, they really aren't as competitive as, say, as they used to be some years ago, where that there would be more of an interest rate play by buying the, the utilities to get the uh, the very high dividend yields. They just really, um, I, I don't think, can... can uh, be as competitive just as intermediate treasuries. Push that blue button there. Margie, thanks so much for joining us here. Margie Patel, Senior Portfolio Manager, Allspring Global Investments, joining us from Boston via Zoom. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Jess Menton sitting in for Alex Steele. I'm Paul Sweeney. We're live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, streaming live on the internet, John Tucker. That's the internet. Uh, you I've, heard of that. I've, I've heard of that. I've heard of that. YouTube.com, and you can search Bloomberg uh, Podcast, and that's where you'll find us. Peter Vosser joins us. He's the chairman of ABB, uh, a publicly traded company. ABBN is the ticker. Uh, they are located uh, in Europe and uh, in Zurich. Our good friends over in Switzerland. My daughter's in Zurich today. Oh, really? Why I she's in that. Zurich on holiday, I have no idea, but that's where she is today. I got something. It is. It's a beautiful city. Peter, talk to us about ABB. What are the challenges you guys are facing here as you think about to electrify, automate, hard to decarbonize industries? Where's your focus of your company these days? Well, thanks for having me. It's clearly it's the energy transition 
which is not only the heart to abate sectors, it's in general the move from a more fossil driven energy system into an um, electric uh, energy system. And there um, we obviously contribute with our products and systems, which gives us energy savings between 20 and 40 or even 50 percent. So that's one angle. The other one is all linked to uh, new technologies around automation and robotics, because we are a world leading company in both areas. And that has to do with um, the reshoring, bringing things closer home again, yep. where the markets are, but also in some countries dealing with the demographics. Uh, because we have less and less people uh, working um, in the working age and therefore robotics and the automation becomes very important. And the last one is AI, which will revolutionize obviously all what's related to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, automation in the future. Well, talk to us more about what you think is the best way to try to scale manufacturing when it comes to the EV charging space. I think what we really need on the the e-mobility side, let me put it this way, um, is really work on two fronts. One is the technical side on the charging side, but the other one is also on the user uh, friendliness side. So that, that they become actually more re reliable, they are much more modern. On the manufacturing side, I think we, we have had uh, Clearly, in some countries and, and uh, regions, there was some scarcity of uh, manufacturing capacity, which I think has been sold. was not an issue for ABB in that sense. But it's the product evolution which is very key. Now, on the other side, I think one should not forget uh, that the whole network of electrification needs to be up to speed. You cannot just actually consume much more energy. You also need to build the uh, transmission lines uh, that the power actually comes in where we have got, um, let's say, the charges installed, either for uh, private passenger cars or for buses, ships, trains, whatever you want to call it. So I think we need much more infrastructure investments on the one side in really, really to actually get the EV uh, charging and the passenger cars uh, based on electrification much more developed in the future future. Peter, who are some of your bigger customers that you're working with these days? We are here in the United States, so we have all kind of manufacturing companies okay. in, in that sense. But on the industrial side, any, uh, any company you can think of, uh, which are they are in manufacturing space, for example, they use our electrification products, they use our, our automation products. So you have all the industrial companies, and that's where we make the difference. The other side, utilities are very key. As I just said, they need to make yep. sure we have enough supply. <clears throat> and I know I'm just looking at our PGEO function where I can see where your revenue comes by geography. You're everywhere. A third in Europe, a third in, you know, you're all, you're comp truly a global company. So Do you see certain parts of the world that are more in front of, you know, kind of making the, the transition than some others? Yeah, I think I would say that Europe has started this rather early, this um, uh, with the new Green Deal in Europe, uh, but also moving into a very, uh, different energy systems. Paid some price with the wars in Russia, so yeah. energy yeah. prices have gone up and uh, some rethinking has taken place. I think here in, in the US, uh, you, you quite clearly see the demand is there in, in all industries, now supported by uh, the, the various uh, acts you have. Uh, here, uh, either the Inflation Act or then also the in Industrial Act, and that is driving investments now. It's much earlier days than in, in Europe, for example. Asia is a little bit of a mixed bag, I have to say. So you see some countries at the leading edge, like smaller uh, countries like Singapore. In China, which is our second biggest market after the US, you see actually a lot of efforts now being put in place to um, change the electric system in, in, uh, in China. A lot of EV cars mm -hmm. are coming in, um, and, and you can see that uh, those really uh, are now generating the growth in China, why it is subdued compared to, to the US at this stage. So indeed, we are operating across the world uh, in more than 100 countries. Okay, uh, we get good insights. At the moment, the driving forces are really the US and Europe, uh, with, um, let's say, Asia, apart from India, uh, are lacking somewhat. So where else do you go to expand from here when you already are in so many places? It's quite clearly US is our key number one market, uh, and that's where we are developing. We have, over the last 10 years, we have put more than $14 billion in 
into uh, the US in terms of investments. Um, we have got 40 manufacturing sites in 20 states. We're operating in all states with our services, etc. So that's a key market. We see the electrification market in the US as, as key, but also the industrial one, which has a lot to do with bringing home, uh, let's say, manufacturing cap uh, capabilities and capacity. And then the second one is clearly um, India, which at the moment is, in terms of growth, outstripping every, all other countries in a, in a big way. Uh, they are very low in manufacturing ca uh, capacity, and that's where a lot of investments now for the high-end um, manufacturing goes in. And then the third one will be Europe, quite clearly, uh, as uh, the European change in the energy system, but also the demographic issues which we have in, uh, in Europe, which will take out, what, 50 million kind of um, uh, working people over the next 10 years, and that needs to be replaced by automation and robotics. So there's a lot of investments yep. ongoing there. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you coming here. Peter Bosser, he's the chairman of ABB. The ticker symbol to put into your Bloomberg terminal, ABBN, trades in Switzerland. Stock's up about half a percent today. All-time high for the stock today. So that's why we get the audience for <laughs> you, the stock's at an all-time high. It's got a 93 go. uh, billion Swiss franc uh, market cap, so not too shabby. Peter Bosser from ABB joining us here. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's talk about global energy, uh, and we do that with uh, Ellen Wald, and uh, she joins us from Transversal. Ellen, I'm seeing WTI crude oil off about 3.2% here today at $74.50. What's your thoughts here, Ellen, about the, the global energy market? What's kind of winning the day here? Supply, demand, what should we be focusing on? I think right now we're seeing kind of a, a some of a, a reaction to OPEC Plus's uh, recent decision to start to maybe unwind the voluntary supply cuts uh, in 2025. Uh, so we're not actually talking about a whole lot of oil. They're still keeping a lot of their supply cuts in place. Um, but I don't think that the market really uh, expected such long term guidance from OPEC. Uh, and so it's uh, they're reacting to that. And um, it, it, it's kind of interesting because um, Gasoline prices in the U.S. are also trending downward, uh, which is not something we'd usually expect, uh, you know, with this summer driving season starting. Uh, I think that uh, there's kind of some tension here between um, what is looking could potentially be a slightly undersupplied market or if, uh, you know, we keep seeing inflation uh, running high, then uh, we could even see, um, see the reverse. And I think the markets are just not quite sure at this point, you know, what to expect this summer. So it seems as if there's no room for more supply if the group, when we are talking about OPEC Plus, wants to defend those prices, let alone push them higher. Walk us through the dynamic here of what's set up over the next couple of months. Yeah, so the group has basically decided to hold their current production level steady um, through the rest of 2024. And then starting in 2025, uh, they, the plan is that they, um, some countries are going, well, UAE in particular is going to start uh, producing a little bit more because their baseline production is going to start to be inching up. And other countries like Saudi Arabia and um, Russia and other countries that have made extra voluntary cuts are going to slowly start to unwind those, uh, you know, mid-2025. So this is really just a very gradual process. And I think part of it is because they really didn't want to shock the market. They really don't want prices to fall. Uh, I think they're very happy, or at least Saudi Arabia is quite happy with prices in, uh, you know, in the 80s. That generally tends to be prices that Saudi Arabia sees as good because the Saudis do not want prices to be too high. They are not like, oh, we want 120 dollars a barrel uh, a country because they see that as basically asking for demand destruction uh -huh. and they want to sell their oil. So, um, you know, it, it is kind of a sweet spot that they're trying to maintain. Uh, I think that prices probably will recover unless there are some serious signs of, uh, you know, economic trouble, uh, you know, heading into, say, a, a full-blown recession or something like that. Uh, I do think otherwise we are seeing pretty strong demand and, and I think prices will probably recover, uh, you know, Brent will recover to to the 80s, at least the low 80s. So Ellen, is it unusual for OPEC to forecast kind of production levels 
you know, so far in advance, it seems like we've been almost on a month to month kind of scenario with OPEC and what are they going to do with their cuts. And but now they're kind of giving us some visibility into next year. Yeah, it's 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 like a whole new world because uh, we kind of got used to this idea of OPEC meets every month. Every month there's a new OPEC meeting. Who knows? Are they going to increase production, decrease it, keep it the same? You know, and and so every month they kind of had to put this together. And I think some people thought that this was a good thing because it meant OPEC was you know on top of the market, ready to make adjustments for everything that was happening. But at the same time. There was no long term sense, you know, there's no sense of what they were looking for long term. If OPEC really wants to be this kind of market manager, um, you know, ensuring price stability, which is really kind of what what they want, then they need to lay out some kind of long term vision. And this is what we've got now. Is the market going to go the way OPEC expects? Absolutely not. I think we could say for sure that's the only thing we know is that things are not going to play out exactly as they planned. But uh, but we can what we can know is that this is what OPEC wants to happen. This is their their goal, and it may not play out exactly as they have uh, foreseen and they have laid out now. They've they've gone through a pretty complex set of you know, and this month we're going to increase by this amount, and next month this amount. It's a very complex set of of steps but at the same time the fact that that traders and also consumers have a sense of where OPEC wants things to go I think is very very helpful uh, for the long-term health of the market what do you think is the most likely outcome to unfold would it be that just an extension of all existing output targets would come to fruition uh, well, I think I, I think that, that that's generally where they are. Um, you know, things could change though on a dime. We could have a major hurricane that knocks out production in the Gulf of Mexico for a month or more, and then we could see OPEC act and say, "Hey, we're um, you know we're going to increase production by 2.2 million barrels a day starting you know next week." So that that's definitely the kind of thing that is not at all out of the question. Uh, and so you have to be prepared for this. And OPEC is certainly prepared to make adjustments as markets market conditions warrant. But the fact that we know that barring these kinds of things, that if if things happen the way they do, uh, you know, the way OPEC foresees, then they are there's going to be a very uh, kind of slow and gentle unwinding of uh, of cuts. And, and there will be more supply coming on the market, you know, say by next year at this time. Ellen, talk to us about the American producers. Where are our good friends in Texas and Oklahoma? What are they doing on, in terms of supply these days? I think it's safe to say our good friends in Texas are not partying like it's 2015 <laughs> or 2016. Uh, this is no longer the same market that we saw back then, where it was kind of the wild west of production. Uh, you know, tons of small companies. Everyone was just producing, producing, producing. The cash was flowing from the investors. The idea was just keep up production targets. You know, it didn't even matter if you weren't breaking even. Uh, you know, just produce, produce, produce. Drill those wells. Uh, get those barrels out there. You know, meet payroll, those days are gone. Uh, they, they're, they are way in the rear view mirror. We've got, you know, a lot of consolidations. We've got people making very smart decisions about where they're drilling uh, and exactly how much oil they plan to get from wells. There's a lot of very precise uh, imaging going on. Uh, a lot of these companies are considering exactly what's around them. Their acreage has expanded. Uh, they're making very educated decisions about um, what wells to bring on the market. Um, they're also facing a lot of inflationary pressures. We often think that inflation is something that high oil prices cause on the rest of us. But these oil companies also feel the effects of inflation and it costs a lot more to drill to complete wells than it used to. And so, you know, we have to take that into consideration when we're looking at what's going on. I think the wave of consolidations is probably good for the industry. It's definitely much better for uh, kind of managing things, keeping prices more stable than we saw, but it's not always so great for jobs because when more efficiency comes in, yep. jobs tend to get eliminated. All right, Ellen, thank you so much for joining us. As always, Ellen Wald, she's president of Transversal Consulting and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, one of our go-to voices on uh, global energy. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.